it's a pleasure being here, spying amongst friends. The topic of my speech deals with the recent revelations of US spying activities in Europe, namely those carried out by the National Security Agency, the NSA, responsible for producing foreign signals intelligence. I think that this ICD summit is an ideal venue for this topic, as it is designed as a forum for facilitating intercultural dialogue. My contribution to this dialogue shall be to take a step back and discuss the arguments made on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, see where either side is coming from and comment on possible implications for transatlantic cooperation. It occurred to me that uh, my topic ties in quite nicely with the announcement for this Washington summit that focused on the deterioration of Russian-U.S. relations. As we all know, Edward Snowden, a former NSA contractor, has been dec disclosing documents about U.S. spying programs since May. He found refuge in Russia despite the objections of the Obama administration, and in response, President Obama canceled a long-anticipated summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Among other things, Snowden's revelations have included reports about PRISM, um, also NSA collection of phone records in France and Spain, wiretaps on the German Chancellor and the French President and some 30 other senior leaders, and the NSA getting access to email address books and the cloud cloud storage system of Google and Yahoo. The US position, in a nutshell, has been that everybody's doing it, spying. Um, the US just happened to get caught. And intelligence collection is a crucial instrument in the global fight against terrorism, which also very much benefits United States allies. European countries and others have argued, in a nutshell, that NSA mass surveillance constitutes a violation of sovereignty and a breach of domestic privacy laws. Apart from the fact that friends and partners and allies don't spy on one another. I'd like to start with PRISM. Let's start with PRISM, which made headlines this summer. We know that PRISM is a system the NSA uses to gain access to the private communications of users of nine popular internet services, including Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Skype, and Twitter. Access is governed by Section 702 of the FISA, which was reformed in 2008. Now, what does that mean in English exactly? The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, in short FISA, passed in 1978, governs foreign intelligence collection in the United States. FISA also established the FISA court, which is responsible for issuing surveillance and search warrants as part of these foreign intelligence investigations in the United States. PRISM is overseen by the Special FISA Court and therefore also by Congress. Section 702 of FISA allows senior Obama administration officials, the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General, uh, to authorize the targeting of non-U.S. persons responsibly believed to be located outside the United States. So there is oversight, but this arrangement does not really help Europeans or others. The very program is designed to specifically target foreign users of these internet platforms. In the context of PRISM, um, it was also revealed that phone records of US citizens and US persons have been collected in bulk. This dragnet collection has occurred under the Patriot Act and is therefore also subject to both FISA court and congressional oversight. Too close? Too far? <laughs> Thank you. Similarly, other liberal democracies have ruled and oversight, have rules and oversight at home. However, the gloves come off when collecting information abroad. Uh, the foreign intelligence services of, for example, Britain, Germany, or France are prohibited from spying on their own citizens at home, but are not subjected to the same restraints when conducting surveillance elsewhere. Despite this domestic foreign divide and in intelligence gathering, 
that affect all liberal democracies, privacy rights are more stringent in Europe than they are in the United States. These differences are due to, among other things, um, historic experiences with authoritarian regimes and political cultures. While it is impossible to generalize about Europe, Europeans feel more strongly about data privacy, some countries more so than others, even and especially in the information age. Many Europeans tend to adhere to the saying that has been attributed to Vladimir Lenin, to add another Russian to the mix. Um, trust is good, but control is better. Trusting your own national governments is good, but controlling them even better. The same saying can be applied to the United States, although with a caveat. Since 9-11, Americans have trusted their government when it comes to fighting terrorism, period. In my years of teaching counterterrorism and homeland security classes in Washington, D.C., the overwhelming majority of students I have informally polled on this subject matter did not find a problem with NSA surveillance, even if directed against Americans, and national polls actually also reflect the same sentiment, because they trust their government to do the right thing in the global fight against terror. And, so the most common argument goes, I got nothing to hide. Um, the United States also trusts her allies, but controlling them is better. At the same time, Washington expects all allies to trust the United States in the absence of any oversight because the U.S. knows best. This is obviously speaking from a U.S. perspective. While domestic opposition to government surveillance might be slowly growing in the United States, it is far from clear how and if that will restrain domestic collection programs. Congress is currently considering two uh, bills regarding the domestic collection of transactional phone records. The two bills are very different. Um, one would stop the bulk collection of phone records under the Patriot Act and require an individualized, tailored approach. The other would put bulk collection on an additional statutory footing with some additional safeguards. Neither of these two bills is addressing foreign intelligence collection or oversight. I want to move on to something else, um, hypocrisy. There is hypocrisy on both sides of the Atlantic. In the context of PRISM revelations, European leaders had to acknowledge that their own intelligence services not only benefit from NSA activities, but also cooperate with the NSA, and not just the British government communications headquarters. Uh, various terrorist attacks and plots have been prevented and thwarted by means of these partnerships. It is also worth remembering in this context that, in fact, European governments and security services have been uh, working closely together with the United States since 9-11. While the European public and various national parliaments were not always aware and didn't always agree, uh, governments have been assisting the CIA or the NSA. For example, in facilitating extraordinary rendition kidnappings and flights, as well as transfers to and from detention centers. Various European allies conducted interrogations with detainees in Guantanamo and at other detention centers. The European Union has also cooperated, while various EU institutions were opposed to sharing passenger flight data with the United States and different agreements on passenger uh, name records had to be negotiated, the data flows never stopped. In this context, it is interesting to note that U.S. officials last week rejected charges that the NSA had collected data on tens of millions of phone calls in France and Spain, and without the knowledge of their respective governments. They claimed the data had been shared by the respective national agencies as part of long-established counterterrorism cooperation. The French did agree that they worked together with the NSA to collect and share records, but argued that these records had been collected outside their national borders. The hypocrisy goes both ways. The fact that the PRISM program has been targeting Germany, more so than other countries in Europe, indicates that industrial espionage might be the more appropriate name of the game. 
and wiretapping Angela Merkel's phone or that of other friendly leaders certainly has very little or nothing to do with countering terrorism, even if U.S. officials and members of Congress like to point out time and again that many of the 9-11 hijackers were happily residing in Hamburg, Germany before 9-11. Of course, we need to mention also that espionage is one of the oldest professions in the world. States are not supposed to be caught in the act, but every state engages in espionage. What is different about the current revelations of NSA surveillance is the scope and the scale of those, uh, those operations. American civilians' capacities have been compared to nuclear weapons, while many other countries' abilities are the equivalent of only guns. Washington has employed this vast arsenal because it can, due to its amazing, massive, vast technical abilities, and because it is determined to uh, fight terrorists, jihadi terrorists, on a global scale and as far away as possible from the homeland to keep Americans safe. States, and not just the United States, consider in in intelligence an important element of statecraft, and one that is not going to go away. These elements of statecraft include diplomatic, informational, military, economic, financial, law enforcement, and intelligence uh, means. These elements of national power are employed by the United States, but they're also employed by European countries and others who are also spying on other countries or one another in the pursuit of national interests. Even among allies, state interests do not always align. Allies do not always see eye to eye, and governments do not want to go blindfolded into negotiations, summits, etc. However, Intelligence gathering is supposed to be shrouded in secrecy, which is becoming increasingly difficult in the information age. Once spying operations become public knowledge, they quickly illustrate the gap between actions and words, apart from the fact that methods and techniques might be exposed and enemies and or terrorists might be alerted to the fact. But spying operations, once public, illustrate the gap between actions and rhetoric, and this gap or hypocrisy needs to be addressed sooner or later by the political leaders. Whether or not President Obama knew about the wiretapping of Mrs. Merkel and 30 other state leaders, or at which point, we cannot answer today. However, we should point out the consistency between the Bush and Obama administrations in, virtual all, in virtually all matters concerning counterterrorism. This is because counterterrorism policies are influenced by U.S. strategic culture, informed by historic experiences, location, political cultures, geopolitical status, and government structures. U.S. government structures played a key role in the expansion of unilateral presidential war powers post 9-11, as Congress has often taken a leave of absence when it comes to national security decision making. These are facts that appear to have been surprisingly difficult to see or to accept for many Europeans. Examples abound. Guantanamo remains open, indefinite detention and military commissions continue, extraordinary renditions do as well, drone attacks have increased, NSA surveillance programs abound. In some, there has not been a lot of change. Damage has been done and trust has been broken. So what are the implications for transcontinental cooperation? Short of the fact that ambassadors have been summoned, EU and German delegations have been sent to Washington, and phone calls, apologies, and threats have been made. Um, one, speaking of threats, I think it is unlikely that the revelations will indeed derail the free trade negotiations between the EU and Washington, D.C. Both sides are immensely interested in this deal. At the same time, however, it is important to remember that the United States needs the support and the leadership of Europe's powerhouse, economic powerhouse and banker, Germany, to seal the deal. Two. It bears mentioning that the European Union Parliament considers itself 
the guardian of civil liberties, and post-Lisbon Treaty has won important decision-making powers when it comes to the sharing of airline or financial data with the United States, the European Union holds actual powers while intelligence and operational counterterrorism remains in the hands of the member states. Now more than ever, the European Union will look into strengthening EU-wide data protection. The European Parliament already voted on October 31st to suspend a data sharing agreement aimed at detecting terrorist financial flows, the SWIFT agreement. Now, of course, the Parliament's vote was symbolic, not binding. The European Commission and EU member states would still need to approve a suspension of US access to SWIFT, and it is, unli and it is unlikely that they will. More likely would be the suspension of the so-called Safe Harbor Agreement in place for, or which has been in place for the past 13 years, which allows for some 4,000 US companies to collect data from EU customers and transfer that data into the United States. Three, national counterintelligence capacities will likely also be boosted as one implication. Four, others have collected, uh, have called for the development of a separate non-US centric internet and email infrastructure in Europe, which could constitute a significant loss for US companies in the long run. In the meantime, businesses and customers will be driven towards other non-US competitors and look for alternatives to American internet companies that might be better protected from NSA surveillance. Five. The French president and German chancellor have proposed creating a no-spying framework. Um, instead of insisting on such a no-spying arrangement, which would likely be largely symbolic and geared toward domestic audiences, Europe and the United States should try to find some common ground rules regarding intelligence collection and privacy concerns especially if national intelligence services are cooperating with the NSA on data collection. And six, when the White House insists that we don't just do it because we can, and stresses that lives have been saved in the United States and in allied countries, then it also should be able to explain how eavesdropping on friendly foreign leaders fits into the picture and why the president might not have been directly involved in the decision to tap into these communications. Considering the diplomatic fallout, the political costs of surveillance in and against friendly countries and allies likely require some adjustments and tailoring, along with a new cost-benefit analysis. Thus far, President Obama has announced a review of NSA intelligence collection activities. And it is in Obama's best interest to ensure that this does not merely amount to a hollow, perfunctory exercise. Surely, counterterrorism and homeland security cooperation between national governments in Europe and the United States will continue. After all, both sides have a vested interest in countering jihadi terrorism, and both sides benefit from this partnership, also the Europeans. However, there's something else at stake here, and that is something to worry about. The European public, say Francois in, in France, Susan in London, Javier in Spain, Heidi in Germany, Emilio in Italy, um, has lost faith in the United States, and latent anti-American sentiments have increased. This lack of public trust in the United States has implications political leaders cannot ignore. It matters because Europe's democratic leaders are accountable to their publics, and it matters because the United States will find it increasingly difficult to employ soft power, that is to persuade other countries to follow the US lead and partner up as well as accept legitimacy of its actions. And this cannot be in the United States' interest. Thank you very much.